here we are again. Grateful to be in your presence, God. Forgive us of our sins. Stuff we've done wrong, the actions, our thoughts, our... God, if we've mistreated someone, God, if we haven't done everything we were supposed to do in the previous day, God, if we have found ourselves to be unsuccessful in satisfying you, forgive us. Let your spirit reign in this place. Father, we desire you now. We desire your love. We desire your power, your anointing. We pray now, God, that you would specifically be on the line today with us, God, and you would allow your miracle working hand to flow. And God, as people begin to join this line, God, we pray that you would meet us. For we can't do anything without you. We don't need just a normal time of teaching and prayer. We need an interaction with you. In a way in which, God, that you meet our needs in such a way that, God, we no longer have these burdens upon our lives and we can share your goodness freely. Say how faithful you are. Father, we're calling on you, needing you, loving on you, and desiring you today. In the midst of this moment, God, give your servants an authentic outreach, an authentic love for seeking you. Father, we love you. Father, we desire you. Father, we need you. Can't do it without you. Now, God, prepare our hearts and our minds. Give us something unique and from your hand, from your grace, from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for now two and a half minutes of that. I appreciate that, Pastor. We have um, been studying all week long about Christ being our servant, being servant of God, man of sorrows. We talked about the intricate details and what that all means and how that all plays out in our lives today and the importance of it. Amen. And we talked about how the focus scripture always long has come from Isaiah 53. Actually, Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12. And then also Matthew 20, verse 28. But I want you to join me over in John. We read, start reading in John 13 on yesterday, and I left off at verse 12. I want to pick up right there in John 13, verse 12. And it reads, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. John 13, 12 through 17. My God, I wanted to praise God this morning. Praise him for sending his son to show us how to live. Amen. I want us to offer thanks for the humble, practical ways others have served each and every one of us. I want each of us to take some time and go in our prayer closet this morning and confess our sorrow at the opportunities that we missed to serve others. And I want us to ask God to give us the heart of a servant. Do you ever question your purpose in life? As a zealous young Christian, I used to wonder how I could do, you know, certain things or what I could do to make the most impact. 
you know, what single thing, what career or ministry would enable me to make the greatest contribution to the kingdom of God? I'm sure I wasn't the only one, right? You know, that question, while full of youthful ambition, it recycled itself in my mind off and on for many years. And finally, the answer occurred to me that took me completely by surprise. It was simple, unspeculatory, but true. It didn't involve giving up all my earthly possessions, nor did it mean me moving to the inner city to help poor kids or families. Good as all that might be. In fact, it required no drastic change in terms of what I was already doing. I began to realize that the secret to fulfilling God's purpose for my life resided not so much in what I did as in how I did it. It didn't matter whether God gave me a large role or a tiny role. I could still have impact if I could learn to do one thing, to love people in whatever circumstance I found myself. Hmm. I know some of you are like, why? Well, because love lasts, because love never fails, because love does not envy, it never boasts, it is neither proud nor rude, love is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes. Love never gives up. God is love. Love, in fact, is the hardest, most powerful thing in the world. Whether driven, uh, driving a child to school, leading the church, cleaning a bathroom, heading up a multinational corporation, or washing feet, love is the secret to making a lasting impact. To be truthful, I would have found it easier to move to a third world country to live among the poor than to try to make God love present within my family, my neighborhood, and my church. Even now, after years of knowing the Lord, I am aware of the meagerness, meagerness of my efforts. To think about it, it's not always easy to love everyone. Think about how tainted. They are by selfishness. Think about how tainted we are by selfishness. Speaking of how difficult it can be at times to love others, you know, Mother Teresa once remarked, I have found the paradox that if I love until it hurts, then there is no hurt but only more love. This remarkable woman knew the power of love in simple, practical ways. You know, she even said that some of her sisters who worked in Australia on a reservation uh, among the Aborigines, they had um, encountered an elderly man. And she remembers reaching out to him And she remembers explaining that she had never seen a situation as difficult as that poor old man. He was completely ignored by everyone. His home was disordered and dirty. She told him, please, let me clean your house, wash your clothes, and make your bed. He answered, I'm okay like this. Let it be. I said again. You'll be still better if you allow me to do this. So he finally agreed. She was able to clean his house and wash his clothes and discovered a beautiful lamp covered with dust. Only God knows how many years had passed since it last seen light. So she said to him, don't you light your lamp? 
Don't you ever use it? He answered, no. No one comes to see me. I have no need to light it. Who would I light it for? So she asked, would you light it every evening if the sisters came? He replied, of course. From that day on, the sisters committed themselves to visiting him every evening. They washed the lamp, and the sisters would light it every evening. Two years had passed, and she had completely forgotten about that man. And he sent this message. Tell my friend that the light she lit in my life continues to shine still. She said she thought about that very small thing. You know, we often neglect small things. So today I challenge you all to ask for the grace to be mindful of the things that seem too small to capture your attention. Ask God to help you slow down and recognize the opportunities he's given you right now to make a lasting impact in the world through the power of his love. Even be willing to write it down so that you won't forget, so that you can remind yourself and others of how love can cover a multitude of sins. Love can capture a heart that had been hardened by the world's rejection. Love is truly an unstoppable force in which God chooses to win back the world. And as I was meditating on that, the Lord took me over to Colossians 3. He started talking to me about the freedom of forgiveness. Colossians 3 and 13 reads this way. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Do you remember Jesus' last words on the cross as he hung there? We're told it said, he said, it is finished. The most literal translation would be paid in full, actually, when broken down from the original text. But I'll never forget um, my very first car that I paid off in full. After sending in 45 payments, I celebrate the fact that I finally owned my beautiful purple Chevrolet Cavalier. It had, in green cursive writing, Chevrolet on one side, Heartbeat of America on the other side, in the back. It had tinted windows, a sunroof, and it was mine. There were people who loved the car, some who hated it. But the uniquely strange thing about it was that it was mine. When I sent in my final payment, I was so overjoyed, and it took about a month and a half for the paperwork to come back, stamped paid in full. I walked around with my chest held high, a smile on my face, knowing I only had my insurance payment to pay for the car. And the kids and I had not outgrown it, and we were still comfortable in it. It still looked good, still rode good. I had a great mechanic. And he had adopted me as family, so I called him Uncle William, and he took great care of my car. And when I received those papers paid in full, 
I remember dancing and praising God right there in the driveway because I was finally debt free of that, burdened, free of it. You know, part of forgiveness is releasing the person from the debt that we think that they owe us. Refusing to let go of the hurt and the pain someone has caused in our lives will always rob us of our joy. Sometimes, just sometimes. The best thing to do is simply to let something go and cut our losses instead of allowing the weight of an unpaid debt to deplete our mental and emotional energy. In other words, we can forgive the debt and free ourselves. It's a lesson I am continuously learning to apply it to my life. What about you? I have a girlfriend. She and her husband both work in ministry in the local church. And she called me to vent because she was just really so upset. And I had to talk to her, remind her about forgiveness. She and her husband had a couple of old cars that they owned. And they decided to get rid of one of their ancient cars. It needed a little work, actually a lot of work. But in the right hand, mechanical hand, with a whole lot of prayer, it could last a person a few more years. So there was a gentleman who worked at the church with a husband. And he was also a minister. And he said that he could fix the car and agreed to pay for it. So he and her husband had worked out the terms. The man was to pay a certain amount each month until the car was paid for. Her husband didn't do any paperwork after all because this was a business agreement between, between two ministers, two co-laborers. So some lessons are learned the hard ones. So her husband gave the man the car title and the keys. And the man gave him nothing, not one penny. Her husband talked with the man several times about making the payments that they had agreed upon. And he always responded with the promise that he would make a payment soon. How many of you know soon never came? Now, she was serious. Not so much because of the money although it would certainly have come in handy in that situation at that time, but because this man was taking advantage of her husband's kind heart. And it ticked her off in the process. She ranted and fumed for several days until her husband finally said, Honey, I have decided to forgive the debt on that old car. Well, she decided not to. And she grew angry. So she had to wrestle with the Lord with what had come up about this, as she began calling it, the stolen car for days. And she seriously doubted that the man that now had their car gave much thought to it at all. But her heart filled with bitterness towards him. Her joy was gone, and she wanted it back. She didn't want to forgive this man, and she certainly didn't feel like forgiving him. But she realized that forgiveness always hinges on a choice. How many of us know that forgiveness hinges on a choice? We make conscious decisions every single day. But today, I'm reminding us that we can make decisions to forgive those who owe us debt. Forgive those who've done us wrong. Forgive those who persecuted us, who defamed our name, who made accusations against us. Forgive those who spitefully used you. Because in forgiving them, you're setting yourself free. It's the choice to obey God and allow him to balance the scales of justice in his own way and in his own timing. 
when we choose to forgive, we are set free. And God is free to deal with the other party, how he sees fit. Amen. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment, and we can pick up tomorrow on the rest of what I have to say about forgiveness. But I want you all to consider the following questions. And even go so far if you feel inclined to answer the questions in your journal or write down the answers. What are the rewards of forgiveness? What are the barriers to forgiveness in your heart? Are you willing to make the choice to forgive? I challenge you now to celebrate the power of forgiveness in your life. You see, we sometimes forget that forgiveness is a choice. And the moment we open our mouths and declare that we forgive someone of the debt that they owe us, forgive them for what they've done to us, that we release them, but we free ourselves. I know it doesn't always feel like it's fair. I know it doesn't always feel like forgiveness actually manifests in your heart at that very moment. But the more you say it, the more you can believe it. Remember, we're talking about getting it from your head to your heart and head knowledge to your heart knowledge. Where you know a thing, but then you believe a thing when it reaches your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you apply that principle in reverse, the more you say, I forgive this person for doing this, I forgive this person, I release them, I no longer hold them bound to the debt I feel they owe me. I no longer choose to be bitter about what they've done or said. I choose to become better, better at loving better at forgiving, better at understanding that God is in control. Because let's be honest, even if you were to take a person who owed you a debt to court, you may win the court case, but that doesn't mean that the court's going to make this person pay you. The court may put the person in jail for not paying the debt that they owe after it's reported again to the court but it still doesn't get you paid, right? For people who've hurt us, if we could have done something about how they hurt us, when they hurt us, why they hurt us, we would have already done it by now, right? The rejection we feel from a parent, the hurt we feel from people persecuting us, The endless rants when we hear people saying about us the things, the negative things. The, the negative things that people have said that we allow to play in our head instead of us recognizing the lies of the enemy, rejecting them, rebuking them, and sending them back to the sender. And so if we could have changed some things, wouldn't we have already done it? So if we are choosing not to become violent, um, confrontational, or bitter, why not forgive? Why don't we just let it go? Release them from the debt and free ourselves from bitterness, shame, resentment. Contempt. And in the course of freeing ourselves, we allow the Lord to deal with his children, how he sees fit, and in his time. Because we all know that God can get someone better than we can, right? We 
But why don't we do that? So I challenge you all today. Think about that. Meditate on that for just a moment while I close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, today for joining us here, for reminding us of some things, and Lord God, for speaking to our hearts and our minds. Father, please forgive us when we allow anger and bitterness to fill our hearts because we refuse to forgive someone who has hurt us, who has taken something from us, who has falsely accused us. Teach us how to lay down our rights and choose to forgive in the same way you have forgiven us. Help us, Father, to remember the lesson learned. But forgive the person and forgive the debt. Lord, for we know that when we ask you to forgive us, you place our sins in the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is to the west, never to be thought of again. Help us to get beyond the immature statements of, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. Because we can forgive the person and forget what they've done, but remember the lesson that we learned in the course of it. It frees us to love them. It frees us to show compassion towards them. It frees us to move on with life and not be held bound and captive to the past, to that situation, or to that person. Well, we know that it may not always seem easy. It may not always seem fair. But it is necessary for our growth, necessary for our maturing. And so, Lord, as we come before your throne, as we begin to experience you in greater ways, remind us of every person that we need to forgive, every person we need to release, every situation and circumstance that we need to place before your throne. Give us the grace today to be reminded of the things that seem so small. Allow those things to capture our attention, that we may tend to them today. We ask you, Father God, to slow down and slow us down and help us to recognize opportunities that you give us to make a lasting impact on this world through the power of your love. Help us to be willing to love people through their process, love people through their shortcomings, love people through their setbacks, love them through their failures and their successes. And as we work on Loving people, Lord God. We ask you to help us to work on us. That we will love ourselves as you love us. That we will love our brothers as we love ourselves. And that you, Father God, will be glorified and magnified in this earth. We love you, Lord God, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns? Did God bless you? Did he encourage you? Did he speak to your heart? Did he strengthen your resolve about some things? Did he remind you of some situations or some things you need to deal with and confront today? This is our time to share in a second.